Welcome to the People, Passion, and Purpose podcast, where you will hear from creative small business owners in the trenches every single day, talking story, talking lessons, talking failures, talking truth. I'm your host, Nina L. Kovner. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome back to the podcast. This week we have, oh my God, I'm so excited. I'm like been trying to make this happen for, for so long. And the fact that we're doing this on 11-11 is no coincidence. This week's guest is Andy Scarborough. Andy is a salon owner and educator, Reiki master, creator of the Crystal Comb, and owner of Crown Works. A place for beauty pros to learn to serve beyond the service. Welcome, Andy. <laughs> Thank you, Nina. What a magical day today. It really is. I'm so glad we have you on <laughs> as we try to navigate all the energies and and retrograde and Scorpio season and 11-11. So before I dive into all the questions I want to ask, what were you just, you were just telling me about the meaning of today. Let's talk about 11.11 for a second. Yeah, that's I'm my pleasure. My pleasure. <laughs> um, I feel like, well, I, I know that we've talked about this and catching like repeating digits and magic numbers or angel numbers. And that was kind of the beginning of my journey was noticing, you know, the repeating digits everywhere. And the way that I learned to interpret it was that was sort of like the universe like the waiter coming to your table to take your order, right? So you, you've got the CB radio with the universe on and, and they're saying, what would you like? So making, when I caught the magic numbers, just making that like a one minute meditation, you know, coming present to what I was thinking about right now. It's a, it's a really potent um, manifestation opportunity. And so today is like the whole day is like that. Uh, it's an incredible opportunity to get clear, to place your order with the cosmos about what you want, what's working, what's not working and what we're calling in, especially into the year ahead. Oh, I love that. And, and tonight we have a planning class with our A school group. So I love how today's the day to call in our orders. Yes, that that's right. And it's perfect, too. I mean, end of year, we're looking at winding down the year and 2020 vision for 2020 is my mantra. Oh, I love that. You know, I, I have to just keep it real. When you said place your order, I immediately thought of pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you get that. If you want pizza, lady, you get the whole pie. You get the whole pie. Oh my God. Okay. Okay. Yes. What a beautiful day. Let's, let's talk about you. Let's talk about you. So how did you land in this beautiful professional beauty space? How did you get oh, here? Oh my gosh. You know, I feel like I came out of the womb coming into this space. <laughs> Um, I was, I've got some real fun pictures of me, like setting my grandfather's hair in rollers when I was like five or six. Oh my gosh. Um, I, he was such a willing client. I grew up in Texas. And so it was like the land of hot rollers and Aquanet. Um, <laughs> and, and a lot, a lot, a lot of emphasis on, you know, looking right and looking proper. Like my grandmother told me that you dress and put yourself together as a sign of respect for others. Um, and, right. No pressure. Right. <laughs> and so there was just a lot of emphasis on, on looking, you know, a certain way. And I loved it. It was, it was a way for me to be creative. Um, when I was younger, I thought I wanted to be a seamstress. I thought I wanted to be a painter. And when I discovered hair, it sort of felt like being able to do all of those things, mm -hmm. you know, art on a moving canvas and folding hair like fabric. And so, you know, I went through a lot of Aquanet bottles to get there. Like I'm, I'm, I'm now in reparations with the universe or the, the atmosphere for <laughs> all of that damage. Yes. Sorry, um, glow. Sorry, ozone. Sorry, ozone. <laughs> I'm still working on fixing that. Um, but it really gave me such an understanding of dressing hair. And mm. over the years, you know, wedding hair specifically, um, formal finishing, I worked at a theater as I was going to beauty school. And so understanding how the hair could 
make an experience or make a character or build an identity was so fun for me. Wow. And I loved how I loved how um, sort of transient it was too. I often when I taught dressed hair, I thought about it like building sandcastles. You know, it's this enormous effort for something that's so semi permanent. Yeah. And, and I love the kind of meditative quality of that. It's like build it perfectly and then be willing to let it go. Wow. That's deep. I mean, yes. Lena, I don't know if we, if we've chatted yes, yet, but I, I, I don't have a shallow end. <laughs> I know. Well, same, same, but it, it's so true in, in so many, in so many things is letting go of the outcome. Yeah. You know, I, I learned when I learned boundary setting in my forties, by the way, um, that, that was one thing that stuck with me so much is letting go of the outcome, letting go of the outcome, which is nearly impossible for a codependent that, you know, is driven on control and that thrives on con- controlling things they have no control over. And I love how you liken that to um, this temporariness of, yeah. of a creation and really surrendering. You know, it's just a, it's a d- constant constant surrender. I love that. I love that so much. It is. I mean, I think that when you start to see the significance of the opportunity, I I look at beauty as a devotional practice, you know? Mm. So when we're looking at, yeah, real work, like boundary setting and um, non-attachment, you know, these deep core spiritual practices, they, they work fine up in the mountains, you know, in an ashram when you're like yeah, on a, exactly. on a cushion, but like, how the hell do you take that shit to the street? <laughs> on right? a cushion. Yeah. <laughs> and for me, you know, beauty has been a way to do that, to celebrate, to celebrate the impermanence. You know, you ask, mm. you ask how I got here and really, you know, there was my, my venture into beauty and then my venture into conscious beauty. It was like a rebirth into mm. the beauty industry. And that really happened when I lost my dad tragically in 2010 and all of the like professionalism and like showmanship behind the chair and the people pleasing, you know, all of that codependency and approval addiction that comes with a successful career in beauty um, quite often just fucking melted, Nina, and I couldn't keep it together anymore. And so... I had to find a way to deal with what was a heart shattering grief and be really real with my clients in a way that I hadn't before because I didn't have any other choice. And, you know, I think when we're, when we're posed with the confrontation of attachment or looking at our boundaries um, or where we need them, I think there's like, there's a, there's a reaction where we say, okay, well, I'm going to, resign and check out of all of it. And I'm just not going to participate in it because the loss is so much, or we, on the other side, like get clingy and grab and are in fear a lot in not wanting to let go. And so really looking at every haircut, you know, and fully committing to a haircut or a upstyle or a color to make it perfect in that moment, all day, every day on the hour with a new human. And then letting it go and knowing that no matter how perfect I made it, it's going to grow out. It's going to wash out. Um, but making sure that my involvement was still fully present in it. So, you know, we say high involvement, low attachment. Mm. Oh, I love that. I, I love that. <laughs> we okay. kind of went right for it. No, I, I know. It. I'm all, okay, so a few of the next questions, I'm like, irrelevant. Okay, so let's just, let's go. I, I want to learn, I want to hear more about, I want our listeners to hear more about what inspired you to create Crownworks. What is Crownworks? What um, is Crownworks? What is Crownworks? What does is, what is Serve Beyond the Service mean? Enlighten us, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if I'm the source of enlightenment, but I can certainly share my my messy process. Yes. Um, and that's, I mean, that's kind of the basis for crown works, right? That it's not a finished product, that it's a work in process. The crown part of it is, of course, talking about, you know, the crown chakra, 
So if you're, if you're not familiar with the energy centers in the body, there are seven major chakras that are responsible for different emotional and physical, um, sensations, connections, um, and the crown on the top of the head is where we connect to higher consciousness. So whatever shaped hat you want to put on that, whether you call it God, the universe spirit, your highest self, um, any, any helping spirits, ascended masters, teachers, and guides are all kind of downloading through this lid on the top of the head. And so when we're working on someone else, we really have the ability to tend to the crown and take that time. You know, it's like our regularly scheduled maintenance where most people don't have a, a spiritual teacher, you know, that they're studying with. Most people don't even have a therapist and that's a whole, another huge part of this. So for so many, we are a consistent check-in point for them. And by making that time intentional, to really invite it to being an inward experience and a moment of reflection and reconnection to their highest selves and their expression is a way that we're working with the crown and cultivating that time and that connection to beauty um, as spiritual practice for ourselves and invitation for our guests. I love that. And I also love that you said that you mentioned that most clients don't have a therapist um, and neither do most beauty professionals. And I was just watching, um, I don't know if you, if anyone that's listening watches um, Patriot Act with Hassan Minaj on Netflix, but it's an incredible program. And last night it was on mental health. Mm. And he was talking about the the challenge with access to mental health because um, the way the insurance companies fuck with us, which, you know, shocker. Um, But in fact, there are laws that were made that um, that protects us in in fighting for mental health services and um, through our insurances. Anyways, I'm going to talk a lot more about that in, in coming up because. There were things that I had no idea about. And, and, and as we talk about this importance of doing this work and the work that you're doing, it takes so much out of the beauty professional and yeah. also puts so much pressure and responsibility on the beauty professional. And so let's say that I'm a beauty pro that has not yet um, taken the step into therapy, um, or, or created a practice of my own for all of the reasons why it's not accessible, available, affordable, whatever. Um, how, how do you handle that? How would you work with me at, as a beauty pro that understands my responsibility in, in working with the crown chakra? And I want to be more present and intentional with my clients. What do I do though, to help myself? That is such a brilliant fucking question, Nina. And I think that's, I mean, that's the key component. I think in, in the beauty industry, there's, there are a lot of, um, what we call the wounded healer archetype, right? There's a real desire to serve and it's coming from such a place of love and we want to support others and we want to make others feel better. But a lot of times it's easier to project that self-care onto someone else Ugh. because we really don't feel internally like we deserve it, that we're worthy of it, that it's safe for us to take it. And so I'm sure you've heard the phrase, like, we love the way we want to be loved. Of course. And we're like giving the thing that we really need to receive. So when I work with stylists, you know, especially ones that are feeling called into this space, we talk about the the wounded healer archetype and how you really cannot offer a medicine until you've cultivated that healing inside yourself. And it's from our healed wounds that we, that we find what is our true gift and our medicine to offer. Um, So, you know, we talk about sacred space is one of those buzzwords that's out there. And I love that because it's definitely an invitation to use the salon as temple, which I think is gorgeous. Yes. Um, But, you know, we have to start, not but, and we have to start with, there are really three degrees of sacred space. 
there is the sacred space we have within ourselves. There is the sacred space we have between us and the other. And there is the sacred space that we create in an environment. And the sacred space that we hold within ourselves is the foundation block for everything else. So if we don't have the means or have the ability to even tell the difference between what is our space and what is someone else's, um, then everything gets money and we wind up in codependent patterns and approval addiction. And that shows up in ways like not charging what we're worth and over serving and moving into servitude and all of these other negative patterns that are truly the reason that like after two years, I believe, in the beauty industry, only like 20% of licensed professionals are still doing hair. The emotional fatigue, the compassion fatigue, um, the creative burnout, all of those pieces are really a result of not tending to that sacred space within. So step one is what do I feel right now? What are my needs? What are my, like, what is in my container? And most people, when we do the workshops, we do some exercises where they really have never actually experienced what their their own field then like them just themselves feels like right and you can't you can't really tell the difference how polluted you know that energy field is until you experience it for yourself so practices like freeform writing um just regular journaling uh breath work meditation any kind of meditation practice movement just to kind of come back home and explore the landscape of your own mind without any other input lets you know the difference between where you began and the other ends. And Mm. I feel like that's level one. Gosh, I feel like I'm back in rehab. I love it. (laughs) I loved rehab. I think I'm like the only person that loved rehab and I still remain so incredibly grateful for it because it's where I learned about yeah. my own codependency and, and unhealed trauma and, and all of that. And I, I've just I've got to give a shout out, shout out to the Meadows in Wickenburg, Arizona. I mean, it really just changed my life. And I loved how you said earlier that when, when we, it, it's not until we begin to heal our own wounds that we can offer medicine and, and we found, find our true purpose. And, and, and that, is so much of my story and how after I began my healing process, I left my career. I mean, my, I was a lifer. Yeah. And and like, that was never even on my radar ever, never, never. And so, and how that brought me obviously to here. So it it really is, it, it really is so incredibly true. Okay. So you do have workshops. You have a new program. You have a workbook, workshops. I had the honor of experiencing just a little bit of it with Alicia in Corvallis, Oregon. Um, Tell us a little bit about that, like the process, if that's something that I would want to do as an individual stylist. Is this something that is good for owners to work with stylists. Like, tell us a little bit more about this uh, program you've created. Oh, thank you, Nina. It was so fun too to have you at that gathering. <laughs> I just loved how you just dropped right in. And those, the crew at Honeycomb, like they don't mess around. They went deep with the work. Yeah, and I could, and, I could tell. Oh, I just love the way they show up. Um, I mean, the beautiful thing about this work is, and, and as you know, we're all, like, the truth is we're all in rehab at some, at some point, <laughs> there's, are. there's not a person, if you're alive, you've got trauma. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and just because it's relative one experience to the other doesn't make it less real. Nope. Um, so yeah, the, anybody who is interested in, you know, like I say, serving beyond the service, but longevity in your career, um, a bigger sense of fulfillment, uh, as you experienced, a clearer sense of purpose, um, the courage tools and, and, and access to the place where you really find your truth. Um, I believe that hairdressers are like a secret sleeper cell of hidden ninja healers Mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, as we talked about earlier, not everybody has access to therapists. And so we become that person. And, yeah, there's a tremendous opportunity there. So 
to create deeper connection um, as an individual stylist, um, to weave this into salon culture as Alicia has done and really make this part of how they show up in the world. Um, I think it reaches you wherever you are. So the workbook that I created this year was really about access. I feel really strongly that this information should just be available mm -hmm. and should someone feel called to use part or, or all of it. So the workbook was created so that somebody could have a solo independent journey. I also offer one-on-one -on -one mentoring and coaching. Typically there's a big call to do this work, but there's some, there's some block limiting belief that is present that keeps somebody from already having taken action on it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I do workshops, which are really beautiful talking about the way that we reflect back and forth to each other and how the circle, you know, that created sacred space can be so supportive. Um, yeah. So there's lots of ways in. I love that. Okay, we have to talk about this incredible gift that arrived on my doorstep ah. recently, and that is your crystal combs. <gasps> oh my gosh. I mean, I don't even have any hair, but um, what I, I'm obsessed. Tell us about these crystal combs. What are yeah. they? What are they for? How can we use them? Oh my gosh. I need to learn all the things. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, I'm a, I'm a rock hound. I've been a rock hound since I was a kid. <laughs> what I love about crystals, if, if those of you that are listening that are into them, you know, those of you that have never touched a crystal before, um, they are like, they're such invitations. They're perfect invitations into a specific thought or intention. If you work with any kind of Oracle cards or anything like that, it's like you pick one up and each one has a message. Mm. I think about crystals from a vibrational standpoint is like a radio station. So you can tune in to one signal, um, rose quartz, or maybe the or rose quartz is the, the frequency of love and self-love. So you anchor into that vibration, just like you tune into a radio station. And there are as many crystals as there are ideas or intentions. Mm -hmm. It's like Hindu deities. There's really just one for everything. Um, but unlike, you know, traditional dogmatic de deities, there's no, there's no association with it that would prohibit someone or create resistance. It's just, it's a beautiful rock. And it holds also an example of like natural wonder. You know, you yes. look at a crystal and you think, oh my gosh, the earth like spat this out just right. like this. Yes. And when I first started working with crystals in the salon, you know, someone would hold a crystal in their hand and then look at themselves in the mirror and there'd be just this tiny transference of like, wow, I'm not looking at this crystal and thinking, gosh, it would be so much prettier if it were more symmetrical or if its color were different or if it wasn't so bumpy. And we look at that kind of wonder and appreciation of beauty and we project it on ourselves. So we get to see that re reflected back through the rock. Um, the combs came to me in a dream because I was doing this work or starting to really come out of the broom closet in ah. my, <laughs> in my, <laughs> in my own salon. And, you know, I, just like when I started dry cutting years ago, my clients first thought that like I was running behind, you know, they didn't understand <laughs> that this was, this was a new technique and something that I was really dedicated to. So the combs became an in like a, a dedicated tool that was an invitation into the service. And also a reminder for me as I picked it up, just like my dry shears, that I know I'm doing something slightly different with this tool mm. and an understanding for the clients that something different is actually happening here. There's a little bit of um, uh, amplification of the understanding of a difference in value that's happening. Um, the combs themselves are tremendous. I mean, they're like little tiny singing bowls as they move through the hair. They, of course, stimulate the scalp, activate energy meridians, um, and can clear away. The comb itself is a, is a symbol of feminine power. So the act of combing brings order to chaos. And moving through some of the energetic shrapnel that may be in our fields, you know, just from being alive and human in this modern world, um, 
can get removed through that act. It's also a sublimely nurturing act. I mean, thinking about how much we love having our hair brushed or played with. So for a stylist to take even five minutes to drop in with their client and do some combing before they start a consultation, like the more senses that are engaged with us, um, you know this too, this is how we deescalate PSD, TD symptoms. This is how we soothe the nervous system. Um, so it really activates the parasympathetic nervous system, deescalates, downregulates heartbeat, makes us feel safe. And then we can have a deeper, more potent connection. Um, and then, you know, what I learned is when I, when I was doing these treatments in the salon, my clients would be like, well, how soon can I come back in for a haircut? And I thought, <laughs> oh, like, shit, this is going to escalate. This is going to turn into something else. <laughs> And just like the way that when we're talking to clients and they go, oh my God, you know, this is so great. I could never look this good without you. While that feeds ego a little bit, uh. it also is information that like, wow, if they're dependent on me to feel this good, yeah. I'm actually not doing my job well. Nope. So giving them a tool that they can take home and continue this as a self-care practice. And again, most people... I mean, I could riff on like, I think there's seven out of 10 people who could see therapists are choosing not to, like who could really benefit from it. Mm. You know who they're seeing instead, Nina? Fucking psychics. Yeah. Yeah. Because they want somebody to give them direct unbiased bias feedback and they want to feel better faster. There's also an incredible stigma around seeing a therapist or this idea of um, feeling like something is wrong or broken. And there's so much shame that comes up around that. So again, just giving people an opportunity to begin in starting to spend some time getting to know their own internal landscape mm. in a way that they're going to fucking do it. Right. You know, like I have a bicycle in my garage. It's a lovely intention. It doesn't do shit if I don't get on it. <laughs> so to have a spiritual practice that you only practice when you're up in the ashram or like on silent retreat once a year yeah. doesn't actually help in the day-to-day -day life. But what we're doing every night is combing our hair out before bed. What we're doing every week is hopefully doing a treatment on our hair. And so if there's a way to piggyback on that and create, like take the time that we're already using for this self-care that may be more fear-based, right? Like I don't want my hair to look dry or, you know, those kind of things and redirect it with some of that frequency of love and make it a self-love practice rather that. than a fixing practice Yeah, is a way to really like get it in there in a way that it's going to stick. Yeah. That's so awesome. Okay. So I can't even believe that we've already been talking for almost a half hour. Oh my okay, gosh. <laughs> so I know it, I knew this was going to fly by. Okay. So to, to kind of like bring this full circle. So you are also a salon owner. You're dealing with salon owner stuff every single day. How yeah. has this practice, this approach, this, uh, philosophy helped you as a salon owner? Cause I already know you have all the same challenges every salon owner has. Um, I know, I know sometimes we think we're unique in those challenges. We're not, uh, I mean, I'm three decades over three decades in the issues are the same. Um, uh, so, so how does this, can you just give us a little bit of how this has helped you as an owner, as a leader? That's a great question. I actually was just sort of going on a tangent yesterday on IG about the, like, the concept of ownership. Um, I mean, for me, the, the salon is where I have to walk my talk. And sometimes, some days it happens, some days it doesn't happen. Um, but really practicing with my team the same kind of compassion that I'm learning to show myself. And really putting that, you know, to, to work every day and finding the places where I'm not being loving or compassionate or understanding with them or with clients and being willing to do, take that back home and do my own work about where mm. these are representative of beliefs or worthiness stories that I still have about myself. So the salon is literally like a fun house of mirrors 
um, where I'm just getting my own shit reflected back to me all the time. Right. I, I think that when we sign on for leadership, there's a little bit of a misunderstanding that somehow it's elevating us or taking us out of the game. Um, that we don't have to participate in the same thing that we're asking them to. And the truth mm. is when we, when we are in true heart centered leadership, whether you're behind your chair or not, you are in the trenches of doing this work every day with them. And I think that's what creates a cohesive service-based salon culture is not wanting to elevate, you know, out of, out of the experience. I um, love that. Yeah. It keeps, it keeps me in it. That team is my team at frame salon in Santa Monica is freaking incredible. And there's not a day that goes by Nina that I am not humbled by how they show up and how compassionate they are with my own stuff and my humanity. My, my business partner, Stacy Ray Barnes, my heterosexual life partner, um, calls me on my shit in a way that I have never experienced anybody else. And I think that's the thing when we go into business, we think that it's going to be these cordial arrangement arrangements, but the truth is the way you do one thing is the way you do everything. Mm. And where our heart is, where our passion is, where our energy is, is where our work is going to show up. When I got, when I got divorced several years ago, and then the following year I had a business disillusion thing that I had to go into. And I was in with my therapist, like, why is this so much fucking harder than my divorce? And she said, because this is where your heart is. And so that's where the work that you need to do and grow is going to show up. And for me, that's, that's in the salon. That's amazing. Okay. Now, of course, that got me thinking of, a, of another question because at Passion Squared, we talk a lot about brand, of course, brand development, as well as personal empowerment. And, and on the brand side, we're always talking about brand purpose, promise, and people. Have you ever had someone come to this, a, a, a potential team member come to the salon and not believe in crystals and not believe in like all of that, how do you, how do you navigate? Like, do people just like laugh at you or do you just tend to attract people that already have shared beliefs? I think that there's definitely a piece around alignment. Um, everybody's going to be on their, on their own path, you know? And I think that's a misunderstanding too, of any kind of cultural indoctrination that it's not it's not absolute, you know, there's room for a full spectrum of curiosity and experimentation. Um, not everybody needs to be masters in the room. It's not fun if everybody's masters in the room. And that's another, you know, when anytime, I think anytime something that's created to be inclusive becomes exclusive, then it defeats its own purpose. Mm. And so we welcome, we welcome everyone who is interested in it. I think that there's definitely a flow and an alignment to our, the way that we be yes. in the salon that whether it's a potential stylist or frankly, a client, like you got, we got crystals all over the front windows, right? So, so they're going to know, they know <laughs> there is, we are not hiding anything. And so if that's something that really brings up resistance in them or they're just not into, they're probably not going to walk inside. Exactly. Um, and if they do walk inside and they're curious, but afraid, but not into it, but whatever, then we're just going to keep doing us. And either they will, it will open some curiosity and some wonder in them or it will not. Um, but I, I firmly believe that everybody receives exactly what they need out of any given situation. It's not my job as a stylist or salon owner to make sure everybody's cup is as full as mine. It's just to make sure that there's enough flowing so that everybody gets exactly what they want and need. Oh, I love that. Do you have a favorite quote? Oh, yeah, I do. I, um, Pema Chodron, do you know who she is? Mm -hmm. Oh, I love her. I was just chatting with someone last night. She wrote a book that somebody gave me right at this the rude awakening point of my journey called when things fall apart. And in there, she says only to the extent 
that we are willing to expose ourselves over and over again to utter annihilation, do we find what is truly indestructible in us? (sighs) Fuck. (laughs) I don't know about you, Nina, but I've, I've, been through some annihilations and I'm, I'm getting oh. groovy with what's, what's showing up underneath all of it. Yes. Oh my God. That is powerful. I love that. Andy, where can we find you on the internet? Ah, uh, you can find me on the IG at crown underscore works, uh, online at www.crownworks.net. Thank you so much for sharing your awesomeness with us. I'm just so fucking grateful. Oh, Nina, I feel the same. Thank you for your light and letting me play with your party. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Thank you, Andy. So definitely whoever is listening to this, you got to go check out Crownworks. It's a great Instagram. It's very inspiring. Lots of little nuggets of wisdom. And, And if you are ready to take that next step, definitely check out crownworks.com. Andy, thank you. Thank you everyone so much for listening. Have an awesome day. Love you all. Thank you so much for listening to today's podcast. To learn more about Passion Squared, you can visit us at passionsquared.net. You can find us on the gram and on Facebook at Passion Squared. And be sure to subscribe and share with your friends. We're so grateful. Thank you so much for joining us. Have an awesome day, guys. Love you.